Hey there guys, Nedruberg here. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the 16th episode of the Router S version 7 MTCNA guide, where we will be looking at how to perform some very basic troubleshooting on our marketing devices. Now we will be looking at a couple of tools like ping, traceroute, as well as the cool torch tool that we have available to us. But these tools are awesome in identifying potential network issues so that we can either log it with our ISPs or check if it's maybe like a server or application or just maybe an issue on one of our networking devices. Maybe there's a switch that's having some issues. Also feel free to leave a like comment if you have any ideas what you think you'd like to see in any upcoming videos and maybe share it with your friends if you think that they can benefit from some of the knowledge. Anyways, let's dive into the video and do some basic troubleshooting on MicroTik devices. So welcome to the lab and this will be a continuation of the previous lab. We'll be using the same device, the same host to test stuff off of but it's nice that we have this little test bed that we can just work off of. Now, if you're not familiar with the tools that we're talking about, ping, traceroute, torch, don't worry, this video is going to go through all of those things, but I want you to think of these tools as very helpful things in our arsenal as either network administrators or network engineers so that we can quickly identify if there is maybe some potential issue in the network. So let's start off by just talking about ICMP or ping, and to find it on your MicroTik, let me head on to Winbox. It's as easy as just going onto your tool section. Now, it is worth mentioning now already that all of the tools we'll be covering will be inside this tool section. There we can see there's our ping, our trace route, and even our torch. So it's nice and easy to find. If I click on the ping button, we can now initiate a ping towards a remote destination. Now, if you're not aware of how ping works, it's basically using something known as ICMP to form a two-way type of communication. It's going to send something like an ICMP packet to the remote destination, which we might say is Google's DNS server. So I can type in 8.8.8.8. .8 and then when that ICMP packet gets to the remote destination, it will then send its own reply which is an echo reply. It will say, hey, I've received your message. I'm sending you the reply back to say I've received it. And then the devices kind of work out what the latency is between them, how long it took, if there's any time to live, because it's also being used by Traceroute even in the background, if you weren't aware. So if we're doing a ping just to Google's DNS server, it's as easy as just clicking on the start button. And that will actually give us a ton of useful information. I'm just quickly going to stop it just to kind of show you what's happening. But basically, it will have a sequence number. It will tell you which host it is pinging. But most importantly, we can see what the response time is in the time window. We can see what the reply size was, which is how big the packets were. Sometimes you can also increase the packet sizes if you're testing stuff like potential MTU problems. But we'll definitely cover MTU stuff in the MTCRE. But it is worth noting that you could potentially tweak that MTU size up just to test and see if there might be an MTU issue. And then also we've got our time to live, which is just kind of like a nice, let's say, packet loop mechanism just to stop packets from just living forever because that could potentially cause some issues if there was some loop on the network. Now, that is the gist of how we can do a ping. There are a few extra features or functions that we can do. We can even specify which interface we want to ping from. So I might want to do the ping specifically from the WAN interface, which is Ether1 in this case. If I start this ping again, we can see it still responds. And I can stop that. We can see there's also stuff like a packet count. So you can specify exactly how many pings you want to send out, maybe 100. And this cool interval window. Now, use this with care because sometimes I see people abuse this and then they they cause packet loss for themselves even though there aren't any packet loss but this interval will basically set in how many milliseconds it will perform the next ping so this is almost like a ping flood but it's it's not really a ping flood um, but what i could do is maybe just set this down to a hundred milliseconds instead of a thousand because when it's at a thousand it's basically only sending that ping every second when i'm setting this to 100 it's at one tenth of a second so if i start it you'll see the ping will be a lot faster it will do a lot more pings so we might potentially pick up packet loss now what i see what a lot of people run issues with is they might send the interval too low they might make it something like 10 or something and then they start and it's like what <laughs> what is wrong i'm just seeing packet loss because now it's actually way too quick when it's sending these messages out so be careful when you're using the interval. Try and use a value that you know is kind of in that acceptable 
uh, latency value. If we stop it and we go to the advanced tab, there's also some more cool stuff we can do. You can even specify stuff like a source address. So you can say which IP address this should be pinging from. There we can see this is where you could set the packet size. So maybe this is again, just if you want to maybe test for a potential MTU issue, we could mark that for 1472. Now I know my traffic is actually going over some wireguard tunnel, so I might not be able to do 1472. So let's just set this to do not fragment. And if I run this ping again, I'll, I'm actually curious. Let's see what it does. Is it going to have an issue or not? Let's see. Fragmentation. Yes, it's going to fragmentation. So what I'm going to do is just change the packet size to 1420, which is kind of the same MTU value as my wireguard tunnel. So if I do a ping, there we can see it is going through, it is having success. So I'm happy with that. Now, this is again just a quick way to identify if there's potentially an issue. If there was an issue, there's a few ways you would see that. Firstly, you might see packet loss occurring. If that packet loss is at zero or maybe less than 1%, that is totally acceptable. But if your link is having like 20 or 30 percent packet loss that's definitely going to impact user experience people will be like hey the network is really on and off the whole time one moment i'm able to browse the next i can't or web pages are just loading or my emails taking forever to come in that's kind of when you hear the network is slow many times you might see that there's some packet loss occurring and besides packet loss maybe there's no packet loss occurring but you might see that the latency time has increased drastically maybe there's some potential issue with one of the links your isp uses or maybe there's a problem with inside your area or maybe there's some wireless interference if you're using some wireless dish you you might see that the latency suddenly spikes where it's like a thousand milliseconds or 800 milliseconds and that's definitely going to also have a bit of a negative experience for users so you need to take these things into account whenever you're troubleshooting using ping and i just quickly want to show you how you can do ping from the command line as well so let me just head on to the command line and really i love using it from the command line because it's so straightforward you just type in ping you can type in your destination and if we tab it all of the same options are available to us as from winbox it's just my thing to do it from the terminal so if i do a ping to 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 and i do the interval as 100 ms there we go. We can see it's doing these pings and we can see what's going on and we can see exactly how many packets are sent, how many is received, what the loss is, what the round trip time is and what the average round trip time is. And again, the round trip time is just how long it takes for that ICMP message to get to the remote destination and for it to get back to you. So that's it. So that covers ping. Let's hop on to the next one. So our next tool to cover will be the most impressive trace route. Now this actually functions very similarly to my trace route, if you're not aware of what that is. But trace route, just like an ICMP or ping packet, allows you to see what's happening with the network, but it's kind of giving you this x-ray vision to see what's happening in between you and the remote destination. Because Traceroute will actually record the path between all of the hops it's taking and seeing what the latency is between each of those hops and if there's potentially any type of packet loss between any of the hops. So Traceroute is a very, very useful tool when it comes to troubleshooting our Microtex. So if I go into Tools and look at Traceroute, same type of principle, same type of window almost. If I just make this a bit bigger, um, let's see if I run a trace route also to Google's DNS server, I can leave the packet size what it is, timeout, thousand milliseconds fine for me. I'm using ICMP, you can use UDP as well. Sometimes some people block ICMP or block UDP or something. I think it comes down to how Windows and Linux tends to use uh, a trace route where I think Linux natively uses UDP, if, if I'm not mistaken. But ICMP is what you're basically going to see most of the time. And there's a few extra options we can set, but let's just run a trace route just to show you what the effect is. So if I run a trace route to Google's DNS server, what do we see? It kind of looks a bit weird with how this window is scaled at the moment. Maybe that's me, maybe that's a Winbox thing. Maybe that's a new Winbox thing. Uh, if I zoom out a bit, it will make it look a bit better. So yeah, that looks a little bit better if I'm zoomed out. So if we do that trace route, we can also set packet size. So you can also troubleshoot stuff like the MTU. With the trace route, when you start this, this is again like my trace route continuously running the trace route. So we can see it's sending all of these packets. We can see what the latency was on the last time. We can see what the average latency is, best latency, all of those wonderful things. But most importantly, we can see if there's any 
packet loss happening or more specifically if there's any packet loss occurring between any of the two devices in the middle because we'd be able to say hey there is something wrong between these two hops and you can see that's definitely your ISP's issue whereas if it was maybe something on your own network you, you might even see packet loss between your router and your switch if your switch is doing layer 3 type of stuff otherwise you might see packet loss to your ISP's equipment or network and then you can definitely either take a further look at your own equipment or speak to your ISP there's a few things that it could be but this is kind of just what a trace route does again you can set a few extra features or the options here you can specify something like the source address so maybe I want to run the trace route from my LAN network which is 172.16.0.1 which is an IP on the Microtik so if I run it again it still just goes out and it's working so that's pretty cool you can also set stuff like the count and the max hops now the max hops is just a there is actually a default max hop i think it's like 30 by default but maybe you want to eliminate if anything's further than 30 hops away because that's already extremely far away so maybe you want to set that to like let's set it to 10 and start it and then you'll see the trace route should still go through because there's only nine hops between this micro tick and that end point but let's set the max hops to eight and start it again. And I will see what happens. It's only recording up until the eighth hop. It's like not even showing me what's happening afterwards. So that's what the max hops is going to do for us. If we want to do a trace route from the terminal, it is just as easy as just doing tool trace route. And then we can specify what we want to trace route to. So maybe 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. And similarly, I want to use a source address, so I can source dash address as my LAN IP. And again, you can see all of the options just by pressing the tab key, and we can now set a few extra options if we want to, but I don't want to. I'm happy with how everything is, so I'll press enter. And now we can see the trace route is running until we cancel it. So that is the gist of a trace route. I think that's really, really cool. Let's go on to our next tool. Now our next tool is also super useful for identifying issues. It can also potentially tell you if there's some type of loss occurring or maybe even some type of overutilization actually. And that is the Microtik Torch tool. Now to get to the Torch tool, you can just click on the Tools button and go to Torch. And if we expand the window, we can actually set a few options here. You can specify which interface you want to run Torch against. Now, I want you to think of Torch as a cheaper version of performing a packet capture. It's not totally doing what a packet capture is doing, but it's allowing you to see the communication happening from an interface to a another interface so basically you'd be able to see internet traffic you'd be able to see if somebody is potentially using up all of the bandwidth because it would show you what the tx and rx rate is and which vlan they're connecting from and even what the source and destination is you'll be able to see what the destination ip is that they're connecting to and you could take that ip google it see what they're doing maybe they're on some video website um, abusing the network maybe it's some peering peer-to-peer software stuff and then you can start cracking down on some of these things with some firewall rules so that is kind of the nice point with torch now to run a torch i'm just going to run this against my wan interface on ether one and you can specify a few things if we leave it as the blank default values it will actually just scan for everything on the ether one interface but you can be very granular you can specify exactly what you want to search so if i click on start it's going to start doing that and we can see some basic discovery and broadcast stuff happening but no actual traffic is passing through this interface yet so let's do some traffic i'm just going to go onto my virtual pc which is sitting behind that microtik and let's run a few pings or so so i think if i run a ping to 8.8.8.8 .8 can i minus t that yes i can so if i'm running that ping to 8.8.8 .8 if i head back onto winbox we can actually now see there is that ICMP packet. There is the thing connecting. And I could even double click on it to get more details on what's happening. So we can see exactly, hey, 8.8.8.8 is responding to my 192.168.88.229. And it's sending this much 
data and it sent this many packets. So that is kind of really, really useful if we want to figure out what's happening. If you want to see more details or you want to keep entries for a bit longer, you can also just extend the entry timeout. So let's just stop that and extend it. Because sometimes these values just get vanished. So let's just leave the entry for maybe 10 minutes or maybe one minute even. One minute should be fine if I start it again. We should see more information. So yeah, Torch is very, very useful for just having a brief or quick overview to see what's happening on the network. If you're running, you could also even run it towards your LAN interface. If I stop that and start it again, I might even see the interface or the traffic coming back from Google's DNS. So there I can see the source is 172.16.0.100. Because I want you to think of this, you're looking at it, at that packet from the viewpoint of the interface. Now, if I'm looking at it, I'm, I am Ethernet 2. So I'm looking out from Ethernet 2. So that is kind of how you can quickly identify a few things. But it's typically something you'll just run on your WAN interface. But you can do this on your bridge, on your actual interfaces, on your VLANs, uh, except if traffic is being passed by the switch chip, you won't see it in Torch. So that is actually quite uh, valuable to understand as well. If we want to run a torch from the command line, it's also a very straightforward and simple process. So what we can do is just run a tool, torch, and then you can specify all your details. So our interface is going to be ether1. But unlike Winbox, where it's already just allowing you to see everything, you kind of need to specify what you want to see from the command line. So I might have to specify the destination address is anything and my source address is anything remember in the previous video where i might have mentioned what a default route well it's the same for when you specify stuff like source and destination addresses this is just how we say for anything in the networking world so we've got our source and destination addresses maybe i want to specify the IP protocol and that I can make any and maybe we want to specify what else do we want maybe the port and I'll specify any and when I hit enter we can see the same details I can see there is IP packets it is doing ICMP I can see what it's going to or there's the destination there's the source and we can see how much bandwidth it's doing so that is quite useful as well but besides doing the torch from the tools menu, you can actually do a torch directly from the interface menu. So let me show you what I mean if I go to the interfaces, which is also a great place to quickly see if there's maybe some overutilization happening. Because let's say maybe you've got a 100 megabit link and you'll see, hey, this link is using 100 megabits. Then you in immediately know there is potentially some overutilization happening and that would potentially be why people's internet is slow. So if we just double click on the interface, you can actually run the torch from here, there is a torch action, so you can click on it. It will automatically open up the torch menu for us. And now we can run the same thing. It, it will actually now immediately specify it as that interface. So if I was going to Ether2 maybe, and I specify torch, it would select Ether2 automatically for us to start running the torch again. So that is going to be the basis of all the troubleshooting steps that you should be aware of when it comes to troubleshooting your MicroTik devices in the MTCNA. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank you for watching. And I'd also like to thank my YouTube and Patreon members. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. See ya.